So welcome everyone to our um, meeting with Satkriti and uh, Vish Dr. Vishim Bhimal. Um, we have some interesting questions that uh, uh, Mr. Satkriti would like to ask from the University of London. And uh, Vishim, Dr. Vishim Bhimal here is uh, here to answer those questions for us. Thank you. So hi guys, as I mentioned that, uh, as Raj introduced me, I'm, I'm an international researcher and right now one of my area of research is diaspora community and especially Bhojpuri diaspora community, how they are being connected to their culture and how their ancestors started their culture. So basically I'm focusing on Bidesia folk form. Bidesia means a person who has migrated and never returned back. So the woman used to write these songs mentioning about their husband that they went away and they never came back so uh, there were many there were letters which which were written at that time and they were never answered so from that letters bikhari thakur one of a folk artist have started a new style known as bidesia folk form and he used those content and uh, like the stories to present the story of migration so on that, I'm doing research in University of London, as you mentioned, and I'm trying to restart this cultural site with the help of diaspora community. And th that's why the perspective of diaspora become important in this. Right? So the important thing is that how diaspora community is at present time is seeing a Bhojpuri culture. And Dr. Visham has worked a lot being a person who tried to like, he has been living in Trinidad and we are especially focusing today on Trinidad. There are many different uh, areas where Girmitias are living, but today we are especially focusing on Trinidad. So I think Dr. Visham can answer that from what time Bhojpuri culture started, how their ancestors started and being from my side, I will use literature references and there are a few works which about which I will talk. It's one of the work is Roda Redlock work, Tina K. Ramnarayan work, and Lomas Roop Narayan work. They have done immense work on Indo Trinidadian community. So I'm going to refer their work. Uh, let's first listen from Visham, what Visham has to say, and then I will refer their work. So we both will engage in a talk where Visham will tell about the oral narratives and I will refer the literature. So Visham, can you tell a little bit more about that from when right. your ancestors have started this culture? Right, and you mentioned the important word be this year. Um, People uh, from uh, the diaspora would know the word. A lot of people's last name is Bidesi, um, but they don't know the meaning of the word. That's one thing about uh, the diaspora culture, especially in post-British colonies, is that you don't understand the language. So that's what we open to achieve in Caribbean in this time. Now, indentorship started over the, from 1830 to 1920, all over the world, right? Trinidad and Tobago specifically fits in from 1845 to 1970. Right? Um, and just to look at, because it's very important for us to look at the recruitment areas so that we know what specific cultures would have come. Um, this, this reference is from um, Inca. It was made reference to in Dr. Peggy Mohan's thesis, Trinidad Bojpuri Morphological mm -hmm. Study. Uh, for an earlier, earlier period, 18, in the 1840s to the early 1850s, um, the British capital was Calcutta. So, uh, they were only limited to uh, Bihar. And the first, uh, well, at least the, the, the critical mass of Indians came from Chota Nagpur. And they spoke suddenly Bhojpuri. So that, that was essentially the first or majority of people that would have come at that time. And as the British were going towards Delhi, they, uh, they started recruiting more and more from the Western parts of Bihar, right? Um, uh, 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 looking at that, uh, narrative essentially most of the recruitment areas or the majority was from the uh, Uttar Pradesh and Bihar as the British is moving across from east to west um, and Raj is also here he also has uh, South Indian Dravidian Tamil ancestry uh, in the earlier part of indentorship there was a significant number of uh, Tamil Devi worshippers who also came to form uh, it forms part of our identity and our roots um, but the majority of uh, the cultural or type of culture was Bhojpuri. So that um, during indentorship, the most popular performing art was low beat, 
especially the sanskar geets which uh, well people listening would know as sohar geet biyah geet or we was born the wedding janeu and uh, basically rites of passage and also there were songs released the festivals like diwali uh, holi and so on um now you mentioned the bidesia point i know some work was done by dr moritz hasan khan from suriname in link with india regarding this whole bidesia bidesia um is the foreigner so the story of the bidesia which you said where the husband goes away and the wife waits in anticipation for him to come back and he never does is the story of, of essentially bidesia that's why it's so relevant to us because indentured laborers left their family some of them kidnapped and so left and never came back i remember dr peggy mohan and uh, dr moti marhe had a discussion about munglasia which was referred to in their um, in their work and it was essentially somebody who would have left his wife knowingly or unknowingly from india come to trinidad never returned and started a family here in, uh, in the caribbean or wherever else in the us um they are similar would i think in suriname as well so um that is how the bidesia culture really or the style of bidesia expression relates to the indented libra because it tells of his uh, uh not wanted to leave but having to because of the circumstances in india and um not even knowing coming into the caribbean if it would offer a better life but things were so bad that um uh, they kind of challenged the odds and say well mm -hmm. something anything could be probably better than this so uh they came to the caribbean so from 1845 to 1917 um during the indentureship period uh folklore git was most popular but uh, as raj and i have been talking we spoke about after 1917 and 1920s we saw a uh, birth of a new style of music called local classical dance singing or baita gana which is in syria um mm -hmm. it exists in all three countries called by different names but is essentially the same thing uh, one wonders if it's a earlier form of the evolution of shastriya sangeet that is present day or if it's a folk reinterpretation that's still in question um and then shortly after that in the 1940s we saw indian uh, 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 films from india like bala joban which were was in a language now that wasn't the language we know as our bhojpuri language but yes. was in kharibun and urdu based and a lot of words were used from persian arabic origins um in trinidad specifically yeah. uh moving on from that that uh in the movie culture kind of infiltrated now all local classical and folk where it started to become more popular um and then you found like bands uh with instruments copying these melodies we call them saj saj as means decorated uh we we, we call them a saj style of music which is the saj bands that was very popular in trinidad and then we saw an era where the folk songs you specifically spoke of saw a way into mainstream culture that was beyond just uh, in trinidadian it was a uh, it grabbed the audience of the of the entire trans tobago and in the caribbean and that is where it really became yeah. music i would like that's to add i think raj wants to yeah raj wants to add something yeah just a small uh, snippet so i was communicating to a, a friend from fiji his uh, paranani actually had worked in suriname and she had started a family in suriname but she was uh, unwillingly taken aboard the ship and sent to fiji to also work so he was reaching out to me asking about his family that his grandmother had started in suriname fine up that's interesting what i was going through the work as you mentioned that raj uh, there were like uh, second migration also like from suriname there were many people migrated to netherland that that was second migration as mentioned by your friend first uh, her nanny went to suriname and then she went to fiji i think what you were trying to say so what happened as i uh, as i mentioned through i was going through the references roda redlock has mentioned a very interesting point that what happened that when the like uh, what do you say that indentured labor went to trinidad or different part the caste system has vanished among them the caste was uh, like after crossing the black water as you say kalapani in india it was like our caste system was totally vanished at that at that time that period they were just 
Hindu Bhojpuri people and they were trying to communicate with each other in Bhojpuri language. Right. So that was an interesting point. But what I was going through the work of Rhoda Redlock or Roop Narayan work, they mentioned that somehow the caste system was vanished, but gender discrimination still exists when these people migrated there. So uh, what do you think about Visham that point? Because she has mentioned a very interesting point that when they migrated there, for national identity, being a patriarchy society was important. And that's why even caste system was vanished, but gender discrimination still existed among the diaspora community, especially in Trinidad. So have you ever heard from your ancestors or something story like that? Or you have felt that way? No, um, I read in what, what was written. I'm, I'm not sure how much represented the actual truth. Um, yes. I grew up with my dad's family and I give him my own personal experience as a, a descendant of indigenous laborers. Um, my dad's family is Ahiru and that is uh, confirmed in the fact that um, his uncle used to sing Biraha, right? Um, okay. Even though Ahiru were cowhooders, all Indians went to the agriculture when they came to Trinidad because it was a source of sustenance. It didn't matter your class. Um, and my mom's family was Brahmin because uh, I learned to read and write Hindi and my first knowledge of Hindi from my mamu, my mommy's older brother, and he was a practicing pundit. Um, I do remember, for me, my mom has 10 siblings and they are huge age difference. She's the last one. Um, the first, uh, my mamu I mentioned and his younger sister had arranged marriages and arranged marriages were based on caste. Um, they had to marry into a Brahmin caste. I remember my grandmother, also had to marry my grandfather, which was arranged because it was a Brahmin family. Um, I didn't really hear that narrative from my Aji Aji or Putinov's family. Um, and I also remember practices upheld with regard to caste from mommy's side of the family, uh, with regard to interaction with others in the community. But uh, even though mommy's oldest siblings had arranged marriages with the same caste, her younger, young, younger siblings and herself, that was not existent so because my mom was a Brahmin and she married a Ahir. And that was completely normal at that point in time. So it, uh, that, that period, I would say, maybe from the 1940s uh, all the way up to the 1960s. Um, yeah, on that period, the 40s, the 60s, in the 70s and 80s, um, there was a, that, I think, from my own personal experience and my own family's history, uh, that was a transition point of where caste was being done away with, right? Um, in my own personal research on caste, we all know the caste names, and the caste names are essentially professions. So for instance, there is, um, there is Sonar in Trinidad, and they are known to be goldsmiths. This is of the merchant caste. There are Lohars, so there were Lohars in Trinidad, and they were known to be blacksmiths. Um, they were chamars and they were known to be cobblers. Um, so it's a sense oh, of a, my own perspective of it, even from Caribbean Hindustani, is that, and it happens in all societies, not just only in an Indian society, because this caste and stratification of society would have existed in Europe and in, in other areas as well. I yeah, reason, we can see, like in yeah, yeah, you have. Uh, sorry to disturb you, but you are absolutely right. It's not only about caste, like. In, yeah. You can see the present scenario also where the racism has been taking place. So it's not only about caste on the basis right. of your identity, whatever, like even on homosexuality, you are being discriminated. So there are different identity over which you are discriminated. No, but one point I want to make based on the research from Caribbean Hindustani is that um, uh, the whole, even though it is, uh, when, when the caste system existed, or at least a system of stratification, the only institution to pass on knowledge was through the family because they weren't really established to institutions of knowledge so that a son would pick up whatever his father's trade is just because he was associated with his father on a daily basis and he grew up with his family. Um, and then exactly what you spoke about where these professional stratifications would determine who are the aristocracy and who are the, the lower caste. And Marxism comes in here where we see the whole perspective of the who now professionally would have achieved at the top of the ladder would want to hold on to that irrespective of that profession or that function not being worth anymore. Um, I think the, the diaspora is a typical example of where 
Now, uh, because of a whole change in system and access to education, um, and now, well, yes, I'm, I'm born a son or a son, but I don't have to do that. And the whole issue of the miserly ability or the miserly attitude, miserly in the sense of saving, not for themselves, but uh, saving to educated children so that they move up the social ladder, um, contributed to the fact uh, as to why the caste system was irrelevant at this point in time. Um, mm -hmm. My parents are a classic example of that. My dad being, being a retired customs officer. My mom is currently the uh, industrial relations officer in the judiciary of Trent Um uh, it, it, it shows how people now adapt to this new system to move up the social ladder, which was not or is not or was not the case during the period of when the caste system was relevant. Um, so I think that is what would have contributed to it. But again, we're looking back to the caste system, a lot of what we still exist is steeped in it, like for instance, the performance of the uh, Beraha from the Irish past, um, the songs sung by the Godnawalas, who used to uh, do the Godnas for the, uh, for the, the women. Mm -hmm. um, there, there are certain aspects of our expression where even though caste is no, no longer relevant, it's still expressed in the uh, cultural expressions of the Indianas. Uh, Bisham, uh, yeah, yeah. maybe you can add some details on the Brahmanism that still exists in Trinidad. The say again? Uh, Brahmanism. Okay. Um, in in it is it is it is very subtle in essence. Uh, okay, so the the organization for the uh, Hindus, which are Sanatanists in Trinidad, would be the Sanatan Dharma Mahasabha, as well as the is also Swaha. Um, which was a faction of that. Now, I just want to mention that the Sanatan Dharma Mahasabha is a manifestation of uh, the Hindutva movement in India towards the, uh, towards the partition of India and, and independence of India. Um, so a lot of that rebranding of what was Hindu, um, because prior to that independence movement, what was Hinduism practiced before was a bit, it wasn't the same as the that, for instance, Hindus in Trinidad would bury, and that was normal. Mm -hmm. Had issues with it. Um, again, the the the, the smriti uh, and, and the and the because cremation was uh, banned. Yeah, well, it was illegal. Fact, yes, there were, there were no places to cremate because in a Western system that was not common. It was it was burial. Um, it was cheaper to bury. Uh, it was more cost effective. Yeah. Um, and then it, one method of burial based on Hindu scripture is burial. Uh, one method of disposal that is burial. Yes, burial is correct. one. Yes. Is one. Cremation is another one. The Zoroastrian way of the mountain is another one. So that um, I think because Hindu scripture allows, we could adapt comfortably based on change in what is the norm. Because there was no protest as far as I know. And based on the work of Keith McNeil, who had looked at presented that paper, um, it, it, was, it was perfectly normal for a Hindu to go through their final rites on the Ashish Sanskar in a burial and, 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 and still have that hope of attainment of uh, liberation by the Atma. Yeah, no, but, but back to the, the point of Brahmanism, right? And how, uh, the, and how the, um, in the Caribbean, we'd maintain Brahmanism, or we would, at least most Mahasabhas and Athanists try to maintain a certain type of caste background with, uh, uh, amongst uh, pundits. That's what I'm striving at. Yeah, I, I, and uh, I want to say it, it, it does no, it exists one in thing Trinidad, I, yeah, yeah, go ahead. Yeah, it exists in Trinidad even in the, in, the, in the Hindu institution still, even though, but it's more subtle, as I say, as not as, as accepted as mainstream as before. I know, how could you see that thing in a performance art? Like if we talk about Matiko, like if we go through Matiko, I have, uh, as I have worked through it, that Matiko or London art, they have been mostly termed, Matikora has even by upper caste also has been performed in India, it's a ritual. But they have been, been mostly on like uh, being like suppressed on the lower caste. So how do you think on a cultural perspective, how is being uh, like you, how people in Trinidad or Indo-Caribbean, uh, the Girmitias, how they see like still they pers pursue this thing with, uh, with the eye of a caste system or they see as no, a performing it's, it's, art that helps them to and I, go back, I go back to your earlier point where even caste and religion, it, 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 um, 
Okay, so it managed to be, of, yeah, yeah, yeah. This, 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 uh, this group of people coming on a ship of different castes, and even not even Hindu could be uh, Muslim. They were yeah, it, they were Christian. mostly like um, Brahmin, Christian, Muslim. They were everyone uh, in that. Yeah, but what what I wanna what I, I wanna emphasize is that even though we're talking about caste, caste is one mm -hmm. characteristic mm -hmm. where we could show a difference between people. Religion is also another. And the same, uh, and the same, uh, the same dynamic would explain why this caste is no longer significant. Um, so, coming coming into uh, in agile laborers coming here, um, one is that if you have a marginalized people, and we talk about this even before the meeting, is that what going, what is going on in the U.S. right now? is the response of uh, a focusing event uh, that highlights the injustices towards uh, 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 inequity Minority. as well as the disadvantaged people. And that is the dynamic that worked to do away the caste system here in the Caribbean. Mm -hmm. In the sense that, um, yes, I'm, I'm, I'm maybe a Sonar and you're Brahmin or you're Lohar or whatever. But the point is we came on the same ship. We share history. Um, and in a community where we are marginal, yes, uh, our culture is no longer, is not mainstream, um, we have to depend on each other if we are to survive in this. We speak the same language, we, we practice the same daily things, especially as Hindus. Um, one classic example I want to bring up is Muharram, uh, which is called Hussein in the Caribbean, which is uh, the Shia Muslim sect festival uh, celebrating the death of the martyrs Hussein Hassan, um, Hassan and Hussein. Um, uh, now in Trinidad and Tobago, that Hussein is no longer just Muslim. It has it has spread beyond that. Um, uh, the Tasa players are very popular in, mm -hmm. in, in that to do the instrument of Tasa, which is Tasha in standard Hindi. Uh, stick fighting, which comes from both Indian, uh, Indian origin from Goshti and Gatka. Um, and, 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 the, and the martial arts that came with the African slaves are also part of Muharram um, because Tasa and African drummings are, and drumming are also played. Um, and uh, it actually just was Indian people celebrating Hussein. It, it wasn't a matter if you were Hindu or you were Muslim. Uh, the point is this is Indian and this is who we are, this is our identity. And that's one example yeah. of how even in caste that would have led to us as a people coming together to not to, to fight marginalization. It become a symbol of, yeah, to represent your sentiments. It's also become, as I mentioned that, uh, uh, Tina Kiram Nayarana has mentioned a very beautiful thing that uh, people, most of the people, like they don't know that who started folk culture from endangered labor, who was the first person. So most of the scholars or academician believe that that was a woman who started folk culture among the Girmitias because she was the one who started writing the letters and from their letters the folk culture started. So I wanted to mention a very interesting anecdote uh, where one of the lady, they don't know the name, she mentioned like uh, uh, a letter where she writes down from Trinidad, Reliana beri se jahanwana beri se pariswa beri na mor sanya ke bilawa se paiswa beri na she means to say that it's neither train nor the ship that is the enemy, but rather the money. The money was the enemy because of which they have to leave each other. So they believe that these sentiments help to build a folk culture there. And as I mentioned that Rhoda Redlocks mentioned a very interesting point that weaning and twerking, we always think that it was started by Caribbean culture and it was a mixture of Afro Trinidadian. It started in carnival. But she mentioned that whining and twerking was taking inspiration from the Bhojpuri folk culture. Yeah. So how do you see that I, vision? Yeah, Have I, you ever I, heard any anecdote? And, yeah. And, and, and the lines are blurred as to what is Creole and what is uh, of <laughs> Because as you would see from the French Creole culture, what is practice, even though it might be a different language, is, is very similar because I guess we evolved together. Um, now we know carnival, carnival is very popular. That is involved with gyration and uh, partying and having a good time 
it also is a time for social commentary through Soka and Calypso, as the injustices people face. But when we look to the East Indian community here, what is people of Indian origin, we have the Biraha style, which I mentioned, which is extempore. And the Biraha style used to express uh, one, a battle between two people and belittling each other. We call it Pekong here in Trinidad. Pekong is thought to be of uh, Creole culture, but we see it in our Indian culture. One wonders where it comes from. That's why I say there are big lines. Um, then we have the Matikor in Suriname called Matikorwa. Um, in that, women were the ones who, who initially would have uh, 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 part, partaken of that. But the women would sing songs, again, of social commentary about the injustices that they would have faced, about the good things in life, about the bad things in life, after warning the, the right to be what to expect uh, in her social situation that she will now find herself. So, um, and when we listen to the songs that are up tempo and chutney, the same thing we see at Carnival is the same thing we see in, uh, in our way yeah. of dancing and, and enjoyment within the Indian community, persons of Indian origin. And when I look back to my research, even looking at that folk tradition from UP Bihar, you see a similar way in which they would dance. So um, even, and I think the research should, 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 should delve into that, uh, how much of this uh, Bhujpuriya culture that we now uh, misconceive or we, 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 we have a um, uh, misinformation uh, about our Trinidadian identity roots, where it comes from. Uh, there's a lot, there's a lot that comes from Bhujpuriya culture from the indentured laborers and the descendants that have not, that have not been credited. So, yeah, uh, that's what I was asking that, do you think that uh, when uh, Academician mentioned that the uh, part of carnival has been taken, borrowed from Bhujpuri folk culture, so do you think that there is a relevance yeah in that point. No. Right, nobody has explored that intellectual question to collect data to make the comparison. And based on my, my uh, research into the language as well as the Bhojpuriya culture and how it manifests, um, yes, extempo did exist within the Bhojpuriya realm. Extempo is where you ad lib uh, would compose on the spot. Um, Pikong existed in the Bhojpuriya realm where on ad libbing, you would try to uh, mm -hmm. basically hurl insults, which is a Gali tradition, um, to the other person, and they would respond as a tit for tat. Um, uh, regarding aspects of carnival that are not highlighted, for instance, stick fighting, and the martial arts form, which is very popular in, uh, a, around carnival time. Uh, and, and carnival is always given that, uh, uh, or credit is always given to the French Creole slaves for mocking the slave masters. But if you look at the traditions there regarding the tassa being played at the stick fighting uh, arenas along with the African drums, um, the rope jab, rope jab is uh, basically a jester's costume, which is a carnival costume. And the rope um, is the same rope that the Kali worshippers use in their worship to Kali. And the way in which the rope is prepared during that carnival period is exactly the tradition of the Tamil uh, daily worship culture. Um, and even the laveway. So laveway comes from the French lavre, it means the truth, but when we say laveway, it means it is a chorus or the essence of the, of the song, what is the take home message. Um, but it means chorus in Trinidad English. Some of them are in Bhojpuri, and that is not highlighted at all. So even though they might have a melody of African drums, uh, some are, and we have evidence of it. I'm Buj are, are from that Bhujpuriya culture. So slowly and slowly that, I'm actually seeing that what is accepted as mainstream Trinidadian that uh, is not seen to come from the descendants of Indian laborers are actually from the Indian laborers. Indian community. Yeah, that, that's what, uh, as I mentioned, uh, these are a few points as you are taking that, talking that primary source of data is not there. That's what, with the help of my research, I'm trying to achieve yeah. and I think those are some interesting points which need to be come out that how Bhojpuri or Bhojpuri Indo Trinidadian community has helped to develop a culture that is quite famous right now. So it's an important point to note. And yeah, I want to I wanna so, go back to the gender issues you had mentioned because I didn't touch it. I asked a question, it's for what cast, but we didn't really speak about the gender issues. Um, but my personal story with my nanny is that. 
I think she was a pioneer because uh, she's always said a story about how she agreed with my nana to uh, send her daughters to school. Mm. But it was very well known that within the East Indian community, uh, just like other parts of the world where women, women only in this modern age have gotten more, more, more rights in voting and going to school and everything. I think uh, women, folk, or women in the diaspora were disadvantaged in the earlier point because they were expected to stay at home, uh, be domestic, uh, fulfill the domestic roles of the home. They weren't expected to be breadwinner. They weren't sent to school to achieve that. But again, the story of my mother comes in here because mommy's youngest siblings and herself, the younger in the family, women, all went and into, tish, into secondary and tertiary education and uh, they achieve jobs. Uh, I explained like the job of my mom now. My aunt became a, a school teacher. My other sister became a customs officer. So they actually attained the jobs moving up the social ladder. But that was in my mom's time. Prior to her, her sister had a different, older sister had a completely different experience. She had arranged marriage. Uh, she was the sole breadwinner and um, her husband was. And they had, she had to marry the same cast. So I believe yes, but if we now compare that to today, things have changed drastically. Because if you look at the University of the West Indies, um, the prime university or tertiary education institution in Trinidad and the Caribbean, um, if you look at the halls of the medical school, you look at the halls of engineering, you look at the halls of natural sciences, the majority are women, and women of who are descendants of uh, indentured laborers. So that dynamic yeah. has indeed changed. So it, it has been changed, yeah, from uh, the other works also have gone through, but it was an important part that how caste system was vanished in a very young age when the diaspora community, as you mentioned, that still a little bit caste is, system is there, but when they were diaspora community, they went there, the caste system was like, in compared to India, was very little bit. But gender yeah. discrimination was still still prevalent. That was a big question. As I mentioned, there is a one. If you have heard about Dennis Belfond, Dennis Belfond in 2004 Carnival has performed Indian men's song in Trinidadian. Yes. Uh, yes. And she was very famous. Dennis Belfond, Indian men's song was very famous. He explained that how Indian men are masculine. Despite being an Afro Trinidadian, the uh, women wear sari and sing this song. So it became a very popular among Indo-Trinidadian men. But Afro-Trinidadian men and Indo-Trinidadian women started complaining about this thing. And they were upset that if the situation was vice versa, the Indo-Trinidadian men were, would be upset. So it's a recent event in 2004. It's not that long before. So that was a thing too I was thinking about discussing. So what do you think about that thing? This is, this is a very, uh, uh, yeah, a multifactorial thing. Yes, um, there are narratives regarding uh, emasculating Indian male in the past when uh, there were actual stories of uh, uh, Indian men uh, coming out to the forefront to fight for the rights of uh, the Indo-Caribbean people uh, because it was a marginalized group. Um, there, the, the, there's also the issue of mixing between uh, Indians and uh, and uh, Afro Indian, Indian, yeah, Afro yeah. Um, but me, Raj, and I were talking about the experience in Guadeloupe and Martinique, which is uh, kind of different from here. Mm -hmm. One is that they have more and more Tamil, Tamil or South Indian culture because the French recruited from Pondicherry, but they have a lot of mixing among their communities. I want to share something. People don't identify them as as being of Indian origin, even though right. they might have, they, 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 they have, they do have roots. The other thing is that I want to express is that it's very interesting for the Indian in Trinidad and it's very difficult for them to wrap their minds around the fact mm -hmm. that you have a Creole person or a Dubla person, a person mm -hmm. who is not only of Indian origin, to be mm -hmm. a Hindu, to be uh, practicing Indian culture, to be doing puja. Um, it's, 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 it's something that exists, but is not highlighted because it doesn't carry a, a political narrative. A political narrative, and one thing I want to bring into this because we're supposed to talk about discrimination as well, um, is that 
in Trinidad and Guyana, because Raj alluded to it earlier, there's political divide among racial lines in Guyana. Um, they also exist in Suriname and it exists in Trinidad. Um, but I, in Trinidad and Tobago specifically, we have to look at our history, the Black Power Movement, which would have happened uh, shortly after independence of India. Um, it was because now the people, whether it be of Indian origin or, or French Creole origin, uh, were looking towards the current government to uh, carry on this hope after independence uh, to be one nation and, uh, and to be Trinidadian. But, but yet still we find ourselves in a conundrum where we're still in that uh, colonial mentality. Uh, and it is because that, we are divided among racial lines. Yeah. We have to ask the question, you have to ask the question, um, then is this colonialism being manifested in our present situation, not now that the, 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 the Godawalas are not here, or the colonial masters are not here? Now we have an error inherited in ourselves that mentality through the education system and now divide ourselves for the same purpose of an aristocracy. I wanted to no, share gotta, something. Uh, yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. That's, there's right. a small, uh, uh, small piece. Yeah. That uh, what's unique also that I've noticed, especially in the Kovals, uh, uh, that uh, many Af people of African descent will also participate in the uh, puja because they do see, I'm not, um, they do see their particular uh, gods within, within in the root of these Indian deities or these Tamilian deities. So I, I have seen that quite often and I was rather surprised, especially when in Guyana, I have noticed that. So that could also be a reason why, as Vish mentioned, during Carnival with the Whip. Um, but in Guyana, I did see many um, Africans participating in, okay. in uh, Marie Naman worship. But, but what I want to say, Raj, that is important. Why? Because in Trinidad, the Orisha practice, which is the original African, from original African slaves who didn't uh, 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 convert into Christianity. Um, there's a close relationship yes. between Hinduism and that Orisha practice because uh, deities we worship, there's an equivalent in the Orisha tradition. The, the Raki we tie on our hands, they tie the same way. How we yes. lay the pan on the, on the altar is the same way they, 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 uh, they put it out. So there's a very close relationship of that folk culture. Yes. We see it as Indo-Caribbean, but in a different perspective, it is actually uh, uh, Afro-Caribbean in the yes. sense of uh, that tradition. I saw that more, more so in the, in the Tamil parts uh, compared to the Sanatanists. Yeah. Uh, but as I mentioned, you guys, are, uh, Visham has told me about uh, that colonial mindset. But why do I think that still the masculine part of, as I go through the works of Indo-Caribbean -Car uh, culture, I still think that for a long period of time, the, especially the uh, male genders have that colonial mindset in, have pursued that thing that, okay, for them, what colonial have said was the right thing and to be seen in a, in a, a light perspective, you have to follow that colonial mindset and somehow women has become a minority community, the gender, because as I mentioned that Rhoda Redrick has mentioned a very interesting point that if we go back, the folk culture was started by a woman, but somehow in the present time, if a man has did it, we had no his name. But as it was started by women, we even don't know who was the woman. And it yeah, was an uh, important part because Sohar or Baramasa, these are some important, uh, important culture in Indo uh, uh, Trinidadian community, but still we don't know that who started. So somehow I think that colonial mindset has a great impact over the masculine system of indo trinidadian for a long time. I, I, I think that it's a remnant of civilization in general. I mean, it might manifest itself in the Indo-Caribbean space, but I mean, we see it in other ethnicities and other races as well. Um, but the point I want to make is you're very correct. Um, okay, so the Pandita tradition, where we have female pundits exists now. It was, uh, well, at least the first official female pundit was Pandita Indrani, Dr. Indrani Rampasa. Um, she's a close friend of mine, but I was very interested in this topic because uh, now we see a change where women can become pundits as well. Um, there was one pundita who was not officially recognized, again, and it comes back to your point because it is Sanatan Dharma Mahasava. At that time, Badesagan Maharaj, 
was the, uh, I know he was the general secretary or president, I can't remember, but he was the person who was in leading position of the current day uh, Sanat and Dharma Mahasabha, SDMS. And uh, he was also a very prominent person in politics because he was in the opposition. Um, there's something very important to note about that period of Mahasabha development and in, in, in the entrance of Indians into uh, politics um, of Trinidad and Tobago. But he was known not to have condoned the fact or be against the fact that this woman wanted to be a pundit. And there were even issues of her being uh, uh, threatened with violence for, this, for, 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 for taking that stance. And she was not officially recognized because the SDMS was supposed to be the official body to register pundits. So they had the final say. But that again is an example. And then you really look at that premise from Badi Sagar Maharaj and even the Mahasabha now because uh, what men outnumber out women in these institutions. Um, I belong to, the, to some of these institutions that are supposed to be advocates for Indian culture. And yes, the men are about 60% or more than the women. And uh, that, that colonial mentality or that uh, sexism still exists. Because again, you see the men in the forefront. Um, again, they are the ones coming out and stating what are the policies or decisions or uh, initiatives of the organization. And, and, and in my mind, I find the women are not given that opportunity, which is a, a grave injustice. But then again, we have to look at politics in Trinidad and uh, uh, Kamala Prasad Bisesa being the first, uh, second Hindustani uh, prime minister of Trinidad Tobago, but a Hindustani woman, the first Hindustani woman. And uh, I think even India had taken pride in that because she went back to look for her ancestors in Uttar Bihar, and it was a, it was a big it was a big thing in India that uh, a Hindustani woman uh, was holding the reins of power in a, in a diaspora country. Um, that was a, a, a defining point, which goes against the status quo I mentioned now. But unfortunately, I don't think it has trickled down yet into uh, organizations that are for the advocacy of Indian culture at least in Trinidad. We have about, um, maybe about, we can go another five minutes and then we'll have people ask questions. Sure. If that's all right. Fair but enough. I agree with yeah. Isham, but I want to share too that um, there are, there have been certain matriarchs in the past that have uh, done some things. Maybe Visham, you would know, who is the, uh, the Tamil lady that came from another island, right? Yeah, that's Alistair's great-great-grandmother. Yes, the, yes. The matriarch of the Boise estate. And then that's one more thing. Uh, and then another thing would be in the uh, Tamil traditions in um, Guyana, shortly after the, the first generation, the second generation did want to change that and allow women in power. And that created a divide uh, between, and that and even, in, even in Guyana, you have different Kovals that claim different heritages from maybe the, the ones that separated or, what I'm trying to say is that there are some Kovals from the past that, that recognize, um, that uplifted the status of females, where there's, whereas there's some that, that have not. So am I right to say, Raj, then, that I have noticed, because whereas North Indian traditions are patriarchal, South Indian traditions, especially Tamil tradition, there, there was a very... Uh, uh, inherent matriarchal... Uh, exactly, and that's why early on, in, since I lived in Guyana, in Guyana, there was a change that, was, that happened rather early, especially amongst the Tamilians. Yeah. But uh, if you uh, go ahead and check uh, like uh, different parts wherever the colonial have ruled, you can find that the, they have created a similar mindset where they have said it that, okay, whatever the colonials have said is right, whatever the masculines ha are saying is it right, and it's similar. But what fascinated me that when the diaspora went there, they somehow overcome the caste system. But somehow on the gender issue, they still follow the colonial pattern, which they were not able to. But as Visham has told, the time is changing. Uh, I hope that, as mentioned by Visham, it has been changing. But it's an interesting point to do research on that perspective, that how they, they were able to overshadow the caste system, but gender was still prevalent. As mentioned, that most of the women at that time has written the songs which are being used at present time in which are being converted into the chutney uh, right now yeah. are yes, most of yes. being written by the women like yes. you can uh, re, uh, in front of me there is one it's a very interesting kali kotriyam ma bethi 
नहीं रतियों तो किसको बताए हम पीर रे विदेशिया दिन रात बीते हमारी दुख में उमरिया हो सुख सब मिनो नीर रे विदेशिया सो इट वॉज अ head of their time the woman is saying it is difficult to pass the night in dark cell to whom o videsia can i tell my ordeal so the woman was really head of time and with the documents that i am going through my research right now it's quite relevant that at one time even in trinidad that men were the indo trinidadian men were at one time were jealous of women with the mindset the women who were coming from india and the popularity they were getting in even in trinidad at one time they were started feeling jealous so it's an interesting point to research and i think as mentioned by visham also that not more of the primary research has been done on this topic so i think it could be an interesting issue to do research yes especially that i can see that kind of falling in with domestic abuse as well yeah um all right well let's open this up to those oh well visham you want anything else to add or to conclude no well, that's it i think uh, we should put it in question session now All right, so I will unmute uh, those that are in the room, and uh, yes, I have to ask them to unmute. I, I believe uh, they could write the question. I think that you, would be the yeah, 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 yeah on the chat hands, section. So they, they can put up their hands on on Raj. Yeah, they the can put. Yeah, if yes. Yes. Any question? Who would have a question? So we have a uh, Rajan Beldeo. uh he is in the room right now if you have any questions and others if you would like to uh send me a message that's fine too let's see here maybe they're trying to figure out also how to ask <laughs> ask to one you can just tell them that there's a option we just go to the three dots to the right hand side to the bottom right hand and you'd see a thing to put up your hand if you want to ask a question and then raj uh, so like for instance i put up my hand right you put up your hand yeah look look at the sense of the screen is my hand up you see a hand is it clear hand emoji yeah i'm not seeing no hand emoji all right okay well then probably is not is you see but you know i guess they could probably ask in comments then yeah they can ask so in I, comments but uh, we have rajan there Yeah, I think Rajan. Rajan has. Yes, yes, yeah, hi, Rajan. Rajan has worked yeah, a lot on London Arch. Uh, on what? Rajan, have you? London Arch is. Go ahead. London ke naach. London ke naach. Yeah. London yeah, ke naach. No, not the, uh, not the, not. But I actually, I just, uh, I checked in lately in this classroom. Uh, good afternoon, everybody, and greeting from Suriname. Mm-hmm. um i just stepped in where you mostly were talking about uh, contribution of women in mm-hmm. to the in to the development there in open trinidad of course we have similar similarities here as, as well with uh, indian indentured labor uh, fighting against the colonial powers in certain cases there were two uproars one in i think in 1912 uh where a lady was uh molested by a white chief and then the whole village was mobilized to take revenge on the guy and he unfortunately died in the in the event and uh that was she was called the tetria a statue has been erected for her uh how you call it remembrance Yeah, uh, is she the one holding the the mallet in the hand? Yes. Yes, yes. yes. On the Independence Square, I recently installed this. Actually, most of the Suriname's were surprised uh, where that ID came from. That was a small group who fighted for it, and due to the political positive atmosphere, they uh, installed this statue. But there are a few other ladies. in the in the in indentured labor time who were already on the forefront uh later on in political way it was we had our first uh indian uh, how you say that um head of parliament i don't know mm-hmm. how to put in your vocabulary and she was installed in 1996 mrs mm-hmm. uh, marika jwala prasad she was not only the first lady uh 
uh, president of the parliament, but also the first uh, Indian lady on the seat, which was, of course, a really jump from indentured labor to being the, the, the head of the parliament. Uh, of mm -hmm. course, when you all plan to investigate all these subjects in Trinidad, always take, uh, don't forget Suriname because most people in the Caribbean hardly recognize uh, the presence of Suriname in the country. Yeah, Sur Suriname is a very interest, uh, interesting and uh, like a very important place when you do research over indo trinidadian uh, area. So it's, I think there is a one question coming from Subhra Sinha, just a second. Yes. In context to Indian Bhojpuri language in re recent times have come to be associated with vulgar B grade Bhojpuri films. I'm curious <laughs> to know what is the status of Bhojpuri in present day. That's a really interesting question. It, uh, it, it, what it I is. think, what, yeah, Visham, I think uh, would be much better to tell about this because being a native or Raj or being a native. But what uh, in my research I have seen that uh, they have also tried to adapt the same vulgarity which Bhojpuri has been presented in Bhojpuri section like Bihar in India right now. Whatever mm -hmm. I have seen during my research. What's your view on this, Visham? That's an interesting question. What's about the vulgarity yeah, that's concept? Question. That's a pretty question. I, mean, I, didn't, get, I didn't get it. Uh, uh, already to you. Uh, in context to Indian Bhojpuri language in recent times, have come to be associated with vulgar B-grade Bhojpuri films. I'm curious to know what is the status of the Bhojpuri in present day Caribbean land? Okay. Um, uh, yes, I have had people uh, Bhojpuri bolne wale, people who speak Bhojpuri in present day India, talking about that, the fact that it's smutty and uh, well, you, um, even, our, even us ourselves, you know, those, you know, yes. hum logan sochila, bhasha, No, no, it's not broken. No, uh, no, but people think that. Right, so, yeah. okay, let's address the two points. If the first thing is that it's not broken. It's actually a separate language. Um, and even I would say Trinidad Bhojpuri is Creole in the sense that it has assimilated a lot from its environment. Um, it has a vocabulary like Sarnami, uh, that is unique to itself as opposed to Indian Bhojpuri. One point I want to mention is again from Dr. Peggy Mohan. Um, she had written the uh, Rise and Fall of Trinidad Bhojpuri and she had made the point that uh, that Bhojpuri that came with the indentured laborers uh, got saved from the onslaught of, of Hindi or Kariboli hmm. because it was a time when that Kariboli started to uproot all the uh, languages or native languages or mother tongues of, of the people for the sake of uniting India, yes, uh, well, a country is empowered if it has one language of, of communication among its people. Um, but we are, we, we, for want of a better word, got away from it, uh, where our Bhojpuri that we speak here in the mm -hmm. Caribbean, it, um, it is archaic in, at, 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 even at some points words we use are no longer used in any modern day Indian Bhojpuri yes. and modern Indian Bhojpuri has a lot of uh, Kariboli words in it. Um, on the uh, uh, thing about it being smutty, in Trinidad our soka is, is, is I think it's, it has an international thing where you glorify alcohol, where you glorify violence and you glorify promiscuity. Um, it is, it is evident in soca music here in Trinidad. Um, and it has become evident in Chutney music. Chutney music now, which is now in Trinidad English Creole and no longer in uh, Bhojpuri, you might probably hear one or two words in it. But we also <laughs> have to remember that all these things always existed in society. Um, the, the concept of um, Savariya versus Savatiya, or Sautan, is, um, in a modern context would seem, be seen as promiscuity. But if we look at the movie, which recently went past uh, Kalank, um, there was a co-wife. She had to assume the role because the initial wife was, go was going to die. Um, that is very important, again, Sarkriti, in, in the research uh, regarding what you're doing with the folk tradition, because this Savatiya Sautan is actually a recurrent theme in the folk music. Um, if I were to translate that in English and yes. create a song, that would create a great stir. 
but it exists in the musical tradition, uh, I would say in the Caribbean as well. But, uh, but what I think that, uh, sorry, to, uh, sorry Raj, to go on, go on. what I think that uh, vulgarity has, as mentioned by Subra Sinai, vulgarity has different meaning for different community and different yes. perspective. And it's like what we are being followed is not compulsory that other is being seen as vulgarity. And it's a colonial mindset, as I mentioned, that colonial has established this thing, what would be considered as vulgarity and what would not be considered as vulgarity. Yeah, it's, it's, so it's what happened? It changes over Sorry. time. Our perspective. Yes. I say our perspective of what is vulgar changes over time. It depends on the social norm. Yeah, it changes from uh, person to person. That's yeah. what happened. What Bhikari Thakur when started Bidesia, uh, for folk culture, it was always considered as vulgar. Yeah. So they I, I, didn't consider the artistic, artistic style, like Londa Ganaj. They never considered the artistic side of Londa Ganaj. They will yeah. always seen in the eyes like, okay, it's not... See, it's represented as our society culture. So it was always considered as an outsider. So vulgarity right. depends from person to person, from uh, community to community. And what have I... you will do trying to research on the diaspora perspective. What happened in the present time, the Bhojpuri culture, as, as mentioned by Subra Sina, that's a very interesting question. What happened in present time, the boundary of vulgarity has been broken in particular in Bhojpuri areas of India. Hmm. So what used to be happen that there always used to be a boundary. Okay, you don't have to cross this line. You have to perform erotica songs, but that erotica songs does not need to be seen as a way which upper caste or elite class or colonials always consider that, okay, you are going above that line. So in Bhojpuri tradition, what is happening? They, they have crossed that line. So. But in diaspora, I haven't seen that people crossing that line. They are still maintaining that thing to remain close to their heritage. That's the difference I have seen while working in UK also with the diaspora community, the second generation of indo trinidadian diaspora. Right. I've seen right. that they wear sari and they proud feel about their cultural heritage when they perform yeah. on Bhojpuri songs or something like that. But what happening in India, if you go in Bihar, they are performing Bhojpuri songs, which are totally erotic and they are just crossing that line. So uh, a very thin line is there, which could be t considered as vulgar and what is not vulgar. But yeah. there uh, are they, some... I, I, I would uh, like to add so to it. Sure. Uh, as the Bhojpuri language, our surname is very, still very active here. Uh, the, there is a clear difference between the use or abuse of Bhojpuri in India and the coupling with, uh, with the erotic themes. We, we don't I, I can't recall one uh, erotical song clearly stating X on, on sex, etc. in the Surinamese repertoire of uh, Bhojpuri songs. It's, uh, I don't think it's even existent here. I know that uh, in the late 60s from Trinidad there were records with like say four songs uh, in our languages but from Suriname myself I haven't ever heard such a song. Uh, I think that maybe it has existed uh, during uh, uh, seasonal songs like in... in, 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 in Weddings. Uh, fair enough. Uh, Visham, uh, I not, think not uh, Sobra, has, Sobra has asked another question. Can you give some example of those words which are still used in Caribbean Bhojpuri? If you could give some example of the words I, that could be considered as khadi boli or like... Okay, so for instance... For instance, I'll give expressions. Just to go back to the previous point, we also have to remember, whereas Bhojpuri, Bhojpuri culture still remain folk in India, it has now become mainstream in the Caribbean. It, our, our, whereas your, your Hindi, Hindustani is Kariboli, ours is Bhojpuri. So that is our standard. Whenever something becomes a standard and the classical form, then all the remnants, again, which Satskriti spoke of, uh, to that smutish folkish aspect or inferiority complex is is no longer there because now it assumes a new role um and it has assumed a new role in within the caribbean context well, words words like chutundar we use chutundare chutundar dati these are words you wouldn't that we use as not vulgar right but i mean it is vulgar in a sense but again it has assumed a new role yes, I so say, yes. Yeah. 
I want to say, for instance, my grandmother, my nan used to say, my kiriya, my kiriya, I go knock you down. I go knock you down is, is, is a Trinidad English Creole, but my kiriya, which is makasam. Um, so kariboli is makasam, but my kiriya is, is bhojpuri. Um, yeah, it's totally bhojpuri, yeah. <laughs> right. We could hear, yeah. That still exists here. Um, the other one is, um, yeah, I remember, so you said chulu, you said churwa, right? Um, uh, I'm trying to go through the interviews in my head here because I'm not speaking much for you to actually utilize stuff. Um, one, yeah, they say ke khartin in, in Suriname, we say ke khatir, hamar, ke khatir. Um, for ke liye. Uh, so uh, there are certain words that still existent here that uh, people use, but there are also ones like lakar bench, uh, which is, which are, so we have standard English, standard English, uh, Trinidad English, and that is determined by what is used in the parliament. Now, there are words that from Bhutpur tradition used in the parliament uh, or by politicians that have now become uh, standard. When you say Trinidad, Trinidad English, for instance, Vasudev Pandey used it to uh, Banwas. He said that uh, one of his political uh, colleagues w has come out of Banwas. And then that has started to be used by the newspaper. The Lakar Pench is our next one. Uh, I remember, uh, I forget his name, but he was a senator. He had used the term Lakar Pench. Keith Rowley has used the term recently for COVID, um, the, the term Janjat. said, uh, why is the opposition causing all this Janjat? So yeah. uh, there are words that exist in our everyday from Bhojpuri, Hindustani. Um, that is beyond the Indo-Caribbean space. It actually is utilized by everybody in Trinidad and it forms part of our daily uh, diet of vocabulary. Even the word dogla, which is actually a very bad word. Uh, dogla, yeah, I was going to it's mention a very that. Dogla is like, like bastard. It's a bastard. Bastard, bastard child, dogla. yes, bastard. So, it's do, like do, dogla dogla means do. It comes from two, they mix, means mix of two, two elements. Yeah. Do, right. Dogla poetic has become very famous in Indo Trinidadian community or like in Afro Trinidadian community also. Like when two. Yeah. yeah. Because, because why? Um, well, I know Dogla actually comes from uh, Hindustani roots, right? Um, yeah. Intercaste but, child. Yeah, it was. Yeah. It was. It was actually. It, it, it was, again, when we choose these words, they're part of a political narrative. I just want to make that point. Yes. Um, Politicians do that well. And the names I've mentioned, so Eric Williams, I think used some Hindustani words, but one word he was popularly used was Maka Fouchette. It means a uh, mark, mark of the fork, which from French means 11, French, right? Yeah. Um, uh, and he described his political opponents as that. So there, there, there's a political agenda behind usage of the word and which would use and when and what now is ascribed to the meaning of the word. Um, but the whole, the whole point about it is that, yes, even though we accept that the language doesn't exist in Trinidad conversationally and Guyana, it does in Suriname, as point made previously, um, uh, it's still, its vocabulary still forms a, a huge part of our daily expression. Yeah, that's interesting. <laughs> it was really an interesting thing to know. And so I think it's good for today. I think yeah, it's good for today. Yeah, we're yeah, we're lucky yeah. that that they allowed us to go over forty minutes. So yeah. <laughs> so, but it, it was really an interesting talk, and we have a three part. I think uh, uh, with this recording and the audience, we are getting that it's going to be interesting. We have talking about popular culture and caste and gender in the next. Uh, uh, we should talk about the Dalit theology and the migration issue and how the songs started building. That would be an important thing to discuss. Sure, sure, sure. Gotcha. All right. Sounds good. Thank you, everyone, for joining. Thank you, Subra. Thank you, Subra, think, for asking questions. And I think that uh, Raj should tell them that the recorded version would be available. So at ah. least people who would have missed would hopefully get to see this very, very important talk. I think we discussed issues that should be yeah, discussed we, uh, and, and not discussed. It's not discussed. It's like we have been planning, as I told you, Raj, me and Visham were planning for like one and a <laughs> half year. Like uh, when the last year I was, I was in California for a performance. From that time, we were planning to perform in a, uh, basically I am planning to make a documentary. Mm. So with all the COVID situation going on, it's, the situation is really going terrible right now all over the world. Yeah. So let's see how it goes. Uh,
once I start my PhD. So it's right. an interesting thing, thing to start discussing over this issue. Well, I'd like to thank Prithika and, uh, for joining and me, A1, and uh, uh, Ms. Sinha. And uh, yes, Rajanji, Dhanwad. Yes. So thank you, everyone. And uh, this will uh, please share with your friends. Yeah. So thank you from Kirby and the Stunning Dhanwad. All right. Okay. Thank you for the talk, Raj. See you guys again. Bye. See you.